kind of the case with these two guys here. So uh, this is a drawing on the left here from Lear, who was very famous for writing his witty little poems. But he also was an amazingly accomplished parrot artist and bird artist in general. On the right, there's an image of a dragon. And both of these guys would have become um, much more popular in Europe, especially in England, by the 19th, 18th centuries. And this is because we have all these trade routes establishing people going out and investigating new areas of the world, and they bring these guys back, either as skins or as, as captives. And so uh, as you follow these things, and you can look at how many there are, and when they appear, and when there are hybrids, and when they disappear, you can get an idea of what these birds were doing in the wild, and get some idea about the biogeography of these animals. Which is, you know, this information, again, is not always optimal if you have other sources. But as a scientist, you'll take what you can get. And so if there's nothing else available, this art is a great resource. All right, so now we can move on to the Middle Ages. Now, the Middle Ages roughly begin when the Roman Empire falls. And this is a really interesting time because you've got the classical influence from the Roman Empire. You've got all this Byzantine influence from the early Christian church and you've got a lot of pagan traditions still floating around. And so you throw all these things together and come up with some really interesting art. Uh, for the first time here, we see birds being used as metaphors, as allegories. So this is kind of like uh, an improvement almost on birds as symbols, because this makes them even more complex and even more deeply meaningful. Uh, we also see, however, that this starts to taper off just a little bit in the 13th century, because for the first time, you start to see birds being able uh, to be investigated outside the context of the church. So these are examples from one of the really popular things that emerged in this period, which is the bestiary. And this was uh, a method of supposedly capturing the natural history of an animal and then placing that within a religious context. But really, there was very little natural history, or what was there was uh, kind of funny by our standards today. And the heavy influence was on understanding these animals in a moral or ethical context within the Christian church. <coughs> so the reason I think this is funny is that if you look at this up here, this is a picture of vultures. And for some odd reason, vultures at this time, the females were thought to conceive and give birth to their young without mating with um, a male. And so of course, this immediately makes you think of the Virgin Mary and all the different attributes that would have been surrounding her. And so this was a heavy image that was used in these books. And the great thing is that once you associate this image just one time with one story, then anywhere you put it after that, people will immediately call it to mind. And so you can decorate tons of things with this, and people immediately associate with the Virgin Mary. On the bottom is a picture Why do you think that that's yeah. a vulture? Uh, because I know it does not look convincingly like a vulture, but European vultures do kind of look like this. And this is uh, from someone who studied it. I'm not the one who labeled yeah. it. <laughs> I, I'm the one who found an expert who labeled it for me. <laughs> but it is true about the vulture story, even if that... They didn't call it a buzzard, did they? No. This is a different so it would have been more like a bearded vulture? I mean, these are highly stylized. Uh, on the bottom is a hoopoo, again, highly stylized. Um, and these guys were thought to take care of their aging parents which calls to mind the Ten Commandments and honoring thy father and mother. So here's another great way to, to evoke those thoughts in a person without even necessarily writing anything once you've told them the original story. There are other ways <coughs> the Christian church used the animal imagery. Um, so here on the left is a Eucharistic dove, and this would have been a little hinge door for store of Eucharist and its belly. On the right is a lectern uh, for the reading of the Gospels, and that's the eagle of St. John. <coughs> And so, of course, both of these images um, you know, are very important throughout Christian history and also throughout cultures in general. There's already this established thing for thinking of you know, doves. They don't really do anything, very violent. They always look very peaceful. Eagles, on the other hand, very regal, very important. We already saw that eagle was Zeus. So it fits right into what's already felt about these birds, even if um, some of those images are drawn from kind of pagan traditions. But here's an image from the 13th century, uh, which kind of diverges from this a little bit. This is a little bit hard to see because of this thing, but here you see two horses with two riders, and then they've got a falcon right here. So they're going to go out to do some falconry. And this is something, this is a pastime that really becomes popular in Europe at this time. It's kind of spread over from the Middle East. And I think that uh, the introduction of falconry is one of the big reasons we do have kind of this uh, separation from the, the church-influenced art. 
because people were involved with these birds up close and personal. They got to know birds in a different context. They got to know other birds out in the wild when they were out doing falconry. And so we have this art that kind of emerges to capture all of those, those feelings and all of that knowledge. This is actually the back of a mirror, by the way. This isn't even something that would have been necessarily facing the room at all times. This is just a decoration that's on the back of, of a functional piece. <coughs> all right, so then we move on to the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance is really a watershed moment for natural history. Um, this is the time that we see the first still life with a bird. We don't see a whole lot of, of um, more action of still life with birds until later on they become much more important, but this is the first time that we see it. Um, and we see increasingly accurate portrayal because this is a time when people are really interested in understanding the hows and whys of things. And uh, the control of the church has loosened just enough that people can start to investigate things in a scientific way and come up with answers that don't necessarily have to do with religion. And in that context, they're really interested in asking these scientific questions and coming up with realistic portrayals of what they're finding. In this period, we also see the rebirth of classical antiquity. And so we have this art from the Greek and Roman times that's kind of re-emerging. And we're reusing those images and we're reusing those styles. So here are some examples of uh, Renaissance art. Now, again, we have this emphasis on falconry. Here this guy is with his handsome bird. Um, and one of the things that I think is great about this is that you know you do see, you of course don't immediately just drop all your old traditions whenever you come in with some new ones, but you do have this transition period. So even though this is something that we would have seen maybe during the medieval ages, we also do have um, this beautiful plumage on this bird that's so much more realistic than the stuff that we were seeing before. I mean, if you place this next to a bird guide today, it would still hold up really well. Um, on the right, we have an image of uh, St. Francis preaching to the birds. Of course, this story was known before, and the story was told before. But what I like about this is that the birds here don't have some sort of other meaning. You don't look at that bird and think, oh yes, I'm supposed to think of the Virgin Mary. I'm supposed to think of the Ten Commandments. Instead, the birds are just part of the scene. They're doing what the birds do in the story. They don't have any other function except to just support that idea. As I said, this is also a time when we have some natural histories coming out, people investigating things scientifically. And so this is a page from a natural history book, uh, which would have detailed the animals and the plants and what their functions were, what they did, how they related to people. On the right is an example of that rebirth of the Greco-Roman stuff. This is a picture of Leda and the swan. So it's kind of interesting if you think back to that enamel cup with Zeus. Here we are looking at Zeus again in swan form. You can see the style is incredibly different. The bird is a very different thing. And so we've, we've really transitioned. So we're, we're evoking thoughts of the same person, but we've really transitioned to a different way of looking at it through time. 